Welcome to Secure Talk, a podcast for security news, innovation, and excellence. Secure Talk is hosted by Justin Beals, founder and CEO of StrikeGraph. Justin has a 20 year career in technology, innovation, and startups. Welcome to Secure Talk, everybody. Really glad to have you joining us for the podcast today. Today, we have a really special guest, Paul Bingham. Paul is the Senior Vice President and Executive Dean at the College of Information Technology at Western Governors University. Paul, it's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Justin. It's my pleasure to be with you. Excited about this. Awesome. So, Paul, we have a lot of early and career listeners that are really interested in folks like yourself and what you've been able to achieve. And it's one of the places we really like to start because you a chance to introduce yourself too. And one of the questions that I'm always interested in is early formative experiences, grade school almost, right? That kind of started you down the path of what would have been a, what you were selecting to do in college. Yeah, that's a great question. And grade school is probably the right place to start for me. My earliest recollection of the answer to the question of what do you want to be when you grow up was for me since at least sixth grade, oh, I want to be an FBI agent. And my mother way back in those days, even when I was going through high school and through college, people still would, hey, Paul, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would say, oh, I want to be an FBI agent. And my mother would just sort of shake her head. Oh, Paul, you watch too many James Bond movies. And I'm like, James Bond wasn't even an employee of the U.S. government, mom. You got to keep your agency straight here. (laughs) But there was something that hooked me about that. I grew up in a home where patriotism was high and sort of a sense of honor and duty and helping people and, and the excitement of all of the tactical things that the FBI did. It all just really kind of interested me. Of course, when I went to college, like many college students, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to study. I thought I was going to study the hard sciences, either chemistry or physics. And I came back for my sophomore year and took whatever the next level of calculus course was. And I remember clearly sitting in there and the teacher, this is back in the day when they still wrote things on the board and writing this long, complicated equation out and saying, now each of you will remember this from your trigonometry course. And I remember looking at it and thinking, I have no idea what this person is even talking about. And more importantly, I don't care. And I stood up (laughs) and I walked out of the class and ended up dropping it and then thinking, my gosh, what am I going to study? So I took some business courses thinking maybe something in finance or whatever. And one of the required courses was intro to accounting or whatever the early accounting course that all the business students took. Yeah. And I had a few other friends in the same accounting class and they were struggling and talking about how awful it was. And I actually thought it was fun. To me, it was almost like putting a puzzle together. It's like these pieces have to fit somewhere. And it was kind of fun to me to put them together. And it just so happened that I learned along the way, hey, the FBI really likes hiring accountants to be FBI Uh, agents. And so it seemed like I discovered something in college that A, was sort of fun, sort of hard, kind of hard fun, but it was fun. And uh, B, might have helped me achieve my career aspirations. And sure enough, out of college, I got my bachelor's and master's in accounting and then worked for Deloitte for a couple of years And then what do you know? The FBI decided to take a chance and hire me. Yeah, I don't think, you know, accounting to me is a hard science. I just want to say that I'm sure (laughs) you got out of that work. And but I, I definitely am working with financial experts for businesses that I've worked at and then also in the forensic space itself. So much is tied to the money of course. And so it, there's an interesting cross connect here, right? Understanding the relationship of finances in organizations and whether or not a crime was perpetrated. Yeah. That cross connect is very powerful. Yeah, definitely. And I think probably back in the 1980s was when the FBI really started recruiting heavily people with a financial background because they were really going after organized crime in those days. And as you say, well, You follow the money to figure out who's committing the crime and where are the proceeds going. And I think, too, if you 
this goes back, I think, even before our times. But if you look at the stereotypical accountant in the old days, the guy with the green visor on and, yeah. the, and the client would come in once a year with this shoebox full of receipts and say, you know, here you go. And the accountant sifts through all of this information that we would call data now and organizes it and decides what's relevant, what's not relevant, and then prepares a report and delivers that report to someone. And in an essence, in essence, that's what investigations are. Sift through a bunch of information, decide what's important, not important, keep the important stuff, organize it, make a report out of it, and give it to someone in that case, you know, your prosecutors or whoever. So I think the skill set really lends itself. And then uh, also accounting and that sort of skill set ended up lending itself pretty well into the cyber investigations that I eventually started doing. Yeah. I don't talk to too many young folks or young and career folks that are like, oh, I want to become an accountant. That's <laughs> not as maybe as, as big an opportunity. And actually, we hear that there's a dearth of CPAs graduating lately. Yeah. Right? I will tell you, my years as an FBI agent, I traveled around a fair amount. And, you know, the small talk on the airplane, people often, you know, oh, you're traveling for business or pleasure. Oh, I'm traveling for business. And then what do you do is the inevitable question. And it's not that I was some secret spy, but usually you just don't want to go down the road of, well, I'm your friendly neighborhood FBI agent. <laughs> and so the conversation killer on the airplanes was always, I'm an accountant. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was it. They're thinking, well, you're boring and no more questions. <laughs> Thank goodness for you, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's really glad. So one question we love to ask on the podcast is for our young and career listeners that perhaps are interested in, you know, an FBI type career or law enforcement these days. What is that CrossConnect today that you would recommend looking into? Yeah, I got some great advice early on. I guess it was when I was selecting a major in college. And as somebody said to me at that time, choose something that you would be happy doing for the rest of your life because you may actually end up doing it. And I thought that was such great advice because sometimes, oh, I'll study this, but it's not really what I want to do. Well, then by all means, don't spend your time studying it. Find something you enjoy and that you have a passion for. And then, you know, like for me, well, accounting was sort of a means to an end. But if I ended up being an accountant the rest of my life, I would have been OK with that. Nobody would have wanted to talk to me on an airplane, but I would have been OK with that. And I tell people who ask me similar questions, the advice I tend to give is, A, choose something you really enjoy that you feel passionate about and go with it. B is be open-minded because what you think is part of that or what aspect of that might be attracting you now uh, may not be what you actually end up doing. And so be open to the opportunities that sort of unfold as you as you dip your toe into the water. And, and I think C is... Uh, don't feel like you're above any opportunity. If you really want to get into, I tell people this with cybersecurity, if you really want to get into cybersecurity, but the only job that's available for you right now is a help desk position or a SOC analyst, and you and I want to be a pen tester, but the only job I can find is a SOC analyst. Great. Go be a SOC analyst and learn everything you can learn. Take every opportunity that you get. And you never know, you might discover something new that's interesting to you. And at the very least, you're going to learn things that inevitably are going to help you with the eventual landing pad that you end up on. Yeah. And if you want to work for the FBI, don't commit any crimes, don't do any drugs. And, you know, as a general rule, try and keep your nose clean so you can pass the background check. <laughs> Those are pretty good rules for the FBI. Yeah. Absolutely. And I agree with this kind of not carrying the chip on your shoulder throughout your career. There's been times where I was a CEO, sold a business and turned around to want to be a line level contributor and was really enjoyed getting my hands dirty again in maybe in a different vertical or a, a different area of expertise so I could continue to expand horizontally as well as vertically in kind of career. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, my bureau opportunities I came in and with, a, with an accounting background, I was a natural fit for white collar crime. I enjoyed white collar crime investigations. They were challenging the white collar criminals because they stole a lot of money. They could hire really good attorneys. And so you had your work cut out for you even in the courtroom. And yet when this was sort of shows my age, but in about in 2003, I was transferring from the San Juan field office to the Salt Lake City field office. 
And when I was transferring, I had the opportunity to choose which area of specialty that I was going to work in. And this was, you know, 2003. This was a couple of years, about a year and a half after the horrendous 9-11 of 2001 attacks. And the country was doing a lot of sort of self-examination of its law enforcement and intelligence services. And at the time, there, was e there were even rumors that the FBI was potentially going to split into two and have a mm. law enforcement arm and an intelligence arm. It didn't ultimately happen, but those of us that were within the FBI were all sort of scratching our chins saying, gee whiz, what, what's going to happen and where do I want to end up? And I heard about this new cyber squad that was being stood up in the field office. Those 2003 was kind of early days for a cyber specialty within the FBI. And it seemed to me the opportunity to say, well, I have to admit, I'm, you know, was always a little geeky on the inside and liked tinkering with devices and interesting things. So, so that attracted my attention. But it also, I thought, well, gee whiz, that sounds like something that whether Intel ends up being the cool thing or law enforcement ends up being the cool thing, both of them are going to need people with cyber investigative skills. And so it was a new field for me uh, back in 2003. And so, again, to your point, kind of being willing to try something new. And frankly, nobody was clamoring at that time to be on the cyber squad. It opened so many doors and I had so many opportunities for really good formal training by industry experts and to sort of see this development of this investigative program at the Bureau while at the same time the internet is exploding in the world and you know here i am yeah 21 years later as the dean of this college of information technology with with the country's largest cybersecurity program so it you, you just never know where some of these roads end i was looking through your linkedin profile a little bit one of the things that really struck me is between 1999 and something like 2012 you know, the networks that hosted crime, you know, at that point, which might have been a very air gapped internal computer sitting on a desk to the internet and SaaS hosted solutions where crime was taking place must have mirrored, you know, what you were investigating, the types of crime that the FBI wanted to go after. It must have been an incredibly interesting time to watch that transition from that law enforcement perspective. Yeah, there really was a transitional shift, even in what our priorities were. For me, early 2000s, there was a lot of emphasis on sort of onesie twosie criminal activities where, oh, somebody hacked a network and, you know, let's run over there and gather the logs and look through the data and figure out what they did. And hopefully they were somebody who was living in the United States so that we could actually go and arrest them and prosecute them, which was often the case back in those days. To, to that sort of subtly shifting towards, well, those are interesting, but what we really need to be looking at are these transnational organized crimes groups that are facilitating their activities or communicating through the internet. To your point, some of the more centralized use of either communication facilities or then even later, some of the actual computing facilities. Those also introduce some interesting nuances because in the old days, you want to serve a search warrant and get some data from somebody's account. Well, those were in Silicon Valley or they were in your local downtown metro. There was a shared server facility and you went and served your search warrant and got your data and went home happily. Suddenly, you have these international businesses that are storing data in places you can't imagine around the globe. And it's not so easy to suddenly serve a search warrant on yeah. a company, what, what do I do if it's in Ireland now? And I don't know, the Irish authorities don't care about my little piece of paper that says, you know, a US judge says you have to give me this data. And then of course, from there, even moving to national security concerns where, oh goodness gracious, this internet is facilitating people snooping on us, on critical infrastructure, on companies that are helping to protect our national infrastructure and our national defense. And so what are we doing to defend ourselves against that and how to track those activities? And yeah, so there really was kind of a growing up with the technology. And then, you know, to your point, you were an international international director of a legal attache in South America, I believe, right? So yes. feet on the ground trying to work in this globalizing crime situation as a national law enforcement force in the FBI. 
there was some interesting politics there and processes to set that even up as a construct, I'm sure. Yeah, there's no doubt. The FBI has 60 some odd offices around the world. A lot of people don't know that FBI agents are posted around the world. I think there's a TV show called FBI International that comes close to some of those things. But yeah, definitely you're working in another country as a law enforcement officer with no jurisdiction whatsoever. I couldn't run out and investigate somebody, interrogate them or arrest them. I had to depend on either diplomatic or legal treaties that existed between countries, and sometimes the good favor of your buddies at the local national police who like, oh, yeah, sure, we can help you with this. If you want a quick story about my time Please. in Argentina, yes, of course. In, I was there from 2015 to 2018 for three years in Argentina, and I oversaw primarily all of the, all of our, F the FBI's activities in Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. In the spring of 2017, there was a massive ransomware attack that hit the world. Most people remember it when I mention it. It was the WannaCry ransomware attack and went rampant for only a few days, but its reach was extraordinary over those few days. I probably have to be a little cautious on, how, on exactly what I say here, but some of our investigative people who were really looking into that, so I was in Argentina when that happened, I got some information from the FBI that said, hey, we think that patient zero for this attack is actually a computer located in Argentina. We need you to go get that so that we can do the forensics on it and do the attribution to figure out for sure where this attack came from. Well, it, this isn't revealing anything surprising. My counterpart when I worked internationally was the chief of station for the you know, US Central Intelligence Agency, who obviously works internationally. They were receiving the same information from their sources or their, their agency in the United States. Hey, we think patient zero for this, wanna, this devastating WannaCry ransomware attack is in Argentina. You need to find a way to legally seize that computer and get it imaged so that we can do attribution and figure out you know, who are the bad guys behind this thing. And it was almost this, sometimes reality does actually mimic what happens in the Hollywood movies. But yes. even though we were great friends and good colleagues, myself and the chief of station, there was this little bit of sort of like, hey, hey, out of the way, buddy, I'm going to grab this computer. And then also to your mention earlier about different political and diplomatic and legal channels, how do we actually get this done? And what can we reveal to the Argentine government or what can we not reveal to them? And in the end, without going through too many details, the good guys won. The FBI ended up seizing the computer. And interestingly, probably the thing that it hung the most on was certain agencies don't necessarily want to be on a chain of custody that might end yes. up being part of a legal proceeding. And yes. some of us, like the FBI, were very comfortable being on a chain of custody and uh, answering to that in a legal proceeding. It was sort of fun and exciting. And at the same time, while that computer didn't end up actually being patient zero for the attack, it was close enough that all of our experts in the US and some of our other countries that we work with all said, you know what, this was the North Koreans and this, this validates what we think. And we actually, it was one of the few cases I think in the US where we criminally charged North Korea for this attack. Certainly, like those two agencies have very different focuses, right? You know, intelligence and espionage is very different than law enforcement. And I can understand where one might say, okay, we will actually take a back seat for a little bit. Let's run with this one. But to your point, here we have a state actor hitting infrastructure, private and government broadly. And that is uh, one question I thought you could help myself and our listeners with a ton. You know, broadly, it feels like law enforcement here is in a lot of ways FBI to help protect, you know, the country and the, the businesses that are here and the people that work and live here. And you guys have to engage, though, with private industry a lot in the cyber crime work, white collar crime work. You know, that's where these types of issues are, are perpetrated oftentimes. How, how should businesses think about engaging with federal law enforcement so that they can effectively not only keep a great marketplace operating and humming, but themselves safe? 
Yeah, that is a great question that a lot of folks in industry, I think, struggle with, especially now in along the line, although some of it's legislatively required, but along the lines now, too, of some companies even that have some sort of a network breach or a potentially, you know, their data was compromised and they're wondering, do we, who do we tell? Do we have to tell people? Maybe we only want the message to go out to so many people. And if we work with law enforcement, we're going to be on the front page of the newspaper and there goes our reputation or, you know, there goes our business and everything else. There are so many more advantages to making good relationships with, say, your local FBI field office. And the best time to make those relationships is before you have some sort of a catastrophic incident in your in your IT infrastructure, because then you have a friend who you can call and say, hey, remember when we met the other day or it was great having lunch with you. I actually have a problem I need to talk to you about now. And you'll find that A, they can be very helpful. B, they're not in the business of walking into your business and seizing all the computers and locking them up in the evidence room for weeks on end. And, you know, you're just out of luck if you want to put your business back together, nor are they in the business of broadcasting things on the front page of the newspaper without talking to you as a victim and deciding whether or not that's something you want to do, or if there's some reason for the public good. There were some situations, certainly can't say that this is the norm, but there have been some situations too, where say, some company falls victim to a ransomware attack. And uh, by talking to the FBI, they happened to have a key that helped decrypt that data that was caught up in the ransomware attack and were able to facilitate that for certain companies that fell victim to it. But those, you know, it's that's not something that the FBI puts in the newspaper either. And so those relationships I found are much more helpful than harmful. And again, the earlier, the better. It it may seem odd to someone who's a business owner or an IT manager or professional to say, I have no idea how to do this, but I'm just going to pick up the phone and call the local FBI field office or the local FBI resident agency, which are sort of like the satellite offices from the field offices, and say, I work at this company in whatever, network engineering or whatever it is that they do, or I, you know, I run the security operations center or whatever, and uh, I would like to some, talk to someone on the cybersecurity squad. And what do you know? They're, they're actual people, and they will get you to those extensions and talk to them. There is one other thing that I would actually recommend, and there's, well, maybe two, but there one with the FBI specifically has a program called InfraGuard, and it's infra, like infrastructure, I-N-F-R-A, and then guard is spelled G-A-R-D. I don't know if it was somebody with a marketing flair who wanted to be able to say, yeah, you know, it's like guard, but the only thing that's missing is you. I don't know. You know what I mean? (laughs) But because of the way they spelled it. But nevertheless, InfraGuard is a public-private partnership that's been around for a long time. Some chapters are more active than others, but some of them have monthly luncheons and other activities. But the really interesting thing for that is someone who you have to apply for membership in InfraGuard. But then someone who applies for membership does get intelligence or notices shared with them that aren't always shared. It's not like you get access to top secret information, but you may get access to confidential information that the public is not quite aware of. And either as a practitioner, you're learning about indicators of compromise that you could be searching for within your own infrastructure, or you're learning about new techniques or, or something that's going on and it's free. And it it really is a partnership where then people in industry can help inform government what's happening and vice versa. People in government can help inform other people in industry what's happening. That's excellent and super helpful. You know, those relationships really matter. And I would imagine if I were running an organization that I felt had a third party state actor risk to it, it would be high on my list of control activity to create a relationship with the FBI office and join something like InfraGuard. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes we had the opportunity to proactively reach out to companies who who we didn't have a relationship. That was always a that was always a really interesting and kind of fun phone call to make and then a personal visit as an FBI agent because we would come across in our investigations say some actor that's storing information somewhere that that they've that they've taken that they're exfiltrating from some other network and we would find out about companies who have been victimized who are losing data and don't even know it 
And so we had the opportunity to pick up the phone and hi, you know, hi, you know, once again, hi, I'm your friendly neighborhood FBI agent. May I come and speak to your network administrator or your chief information officer, or whoever it is? And, you know, sort of the, you're from, you know, you're from where it's the FBI, ma'am or sir. You know, can I help you spell it? But they would be like, oh, my gosh, what's this about? Is somebody in trouble? No, nobody's in trouble. But then you'd show up and say, I don't think you're aware of this, but uh, we have very good reason to believe that your system has been compromised. Sometimes we could even narrow it down to, you know, usually a particular server, certainly an IP address and yeah. uh, a certain area of a server and the kind of data that was being exfilled from there. And, yeah. and often usually a list of indicators of compromise where we could say, oh, and by the way, you should probably get rid of these things on your network because they are, uh, they're sort of like a you know, roll up door that you're losing data through every day. And that was a fun way to initiate good relationships with, with various companies. Well, you might have had fun, Paul. I'm not sure everybody else did. <laughs> you know, it's like there's that terrifying moment that you're like, okay, I'm glad we know. Let's go after the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You mentioned working at Western Governors University, and I, and this is obviously a, a little bit of a shift from FBI. You've made the switch to academia. Yeah. So I mentioned when I started work, well, prior to being in cybercrime with the FBI and with some of our international relationships, there are some international law enforcement academies around the world. And I had the opportunity, partly because I had this little bit of excitement about traveling the world and discovering interesting places. As a, For instance, I worked for three months in Bucharest, Romania, and traveled to Budapest, Hungary, several times to teach at the International Law Enforcement Academy. Anyway, other places around the world. But the teaching began when I was doing white collar investigations. And then once I started doing cyber investigations, had the opportunity first to learn a whole bunch and then start sharing some of that knowledge with some of our partners around the world. So I really did enjoy developing curriculum and then going out and teaching a one week or a two week kind of intensive course to, to people who were just learning how to do cyber investigations or right. attorneys who were just learning how to prosecute cyber investigations. So most people don't know, but the FBI, FBI agents by statute are required to retire, mandatory retirement at age 57. So when you're 57 years old, you get you know, patted on the back and then shown the door. And so most FBI agents are become eligible to retire at age 50, and then they know that they're looking down the barrel of mandatory retirement at age 57. So for many years, most of us during a 20-year, for me, 24-year career, sit back at lunchtime and say, so what are you going to do when you retire? Because no, while the yeah. FBI was wonderfully gratifying and uh, exciting and fun and satisfying, not the most lucrative career that any of us could have chosen sometimes. I've, I've heard this from some of my friends that work in government, that there's yes. a career after the career. Correct. Yes. <laughs> it's the career after the career to try and make up for some of the money that we didn't earn during our first career. We had our career of love and then our career of financial necessity. And, and I often said I would love to teach. I really enjoyed that teaching aspect. And so when I was looking for the career after the career, I was looking either for teaching opportunities or potentially consulting with my accounting credentials and then some of the, the cybersecurity credentials that I picked up along the way, it seemed like a good fit for consulting. And with no disrespect to uh, those who work in consulting, it felt sometimes like the mission of the consulting groups was to make money. And there's nothing wrong with making money. And, you know, maybe I shouldn't have gone to work for a nonprofit university <laughs> if that was my if that was my goal. But when I, I, I didn't want to travel so much because I had done all of this exciting travel in the Bureau and just kind of wanted to, you know, act like an old guy and stay home sometimes and, and was really motivated by the mission and the work I did with the Bureau. I wanted to, to have an opportunity to continue doing something that where I felt really good about the mission. And with WGU, I discovered what I have referred to ever since as the nobility in the mission here, that of of changing lives through creating pathways to opportunity, mostly through obtaining a college degree. And and I have to admit, I came, he I came here about four and a half years ago. And at first, I didn't know a whole lot about the organization. 
And it was sort of a, well, let's see how this goes kind of approach. And the longer I've been here, the more fascinated I've become with the mission, with the vision of those who created the university 27 or so years ago, and, and with the outstanding growth that the university's had. We have now enrolled across the United States, we have over 160,000 full-time enrolled students. And that it's just, it's just mind blowing when you compare it to traditional university enrollments. Yeah, I worked in the um, education space for a fair bit of my career building online schools. And it was always surprising to me, it's such a massive shift to go from a typical college and a university having 3,000, 4,000 students to we had a master's in education program that was supporting 20,000 students. And we saw organizations like Western Governors University scale to hundreds of thousands of yeah. students. It is a pretty amazing shift in higher education specifically. Yeah. Now, Western Governors University has something very specific about the types of curriculums that they offer. They call it competency-based. I was wondering if you would talk to us a little bit about competency-based education. Yeah, I appreciate the question. It was something I had to learn myself when I came here because I did not stu I studied at a traditional university. And competency-based education, in essence, says... Our focus is on learning and mastery of skills and knowledge rather than how much time somebody spends in a classroom. Said in sort of a catchy way is in traditional education, time is constant, but learning is variable. And in competency-based, the learning is constant, but the time is variable. And as I explain this, I could perhaps give an example, which is if I were to enroll in a course at a traditional university, say rifle marksmanship. I was during my time with the Bureau when I wasn't investigating cases, I was I was a SWAT, SWAT team member and, and was trained as a sniper. And so if I were to enroll in a course at a university on rifle marksmanship, a traditional university would say, great, welcome to the course. Here's your syllabus and you'll be here for the entirety of the semester. You'll have some homework exercises. You'll have a midterm. You'll have some more, maybe a group exercise, whatever. And your final exam is at the end of the term. Well, for, for you know, intro to rifle marksmanship, I probably will be able to pass that final without doing anything else. Competency-based education says, take the time that you need to prepare and then take the exam. So in for instance, at WGU, we don't have intro to rifle marksmanship, but if we did, I should have picked cryptography or cyber <laughs> investigations. Oh, I like this one because I think you get the, the bullseye at the final, you, you pass the Yeah, course, exactly. Right? The analogy yeah. works no matter what. <laughs> that's right. But the analogy is under competency-based, the only thing that's really required and that all things point to, all of the learning activities, all of the quizzes you might take to help reinforce your learning, the only thing that's really required is the final exam. And so if I come in and I take a look at the course and say, well, gee whiz, I know this. I think I could pass this test. I generally would meet with my instructor here instead of professor, we call him a course instructor. And they probably would say, well, gee whiz, it sounds like you're ready for this exam. Why don't you go ahead and schedule it? And there's a pre-assessment or a, like a pre-test that helps gauge your readiness. I probably would have taken that and said, See, I, I think I know what I'm doing. And, you know, one day later, two days later, I, I sit for the final exam and pass it and I move on to the next course. It's intriguing to me, this competency-based education model, especially when we think about cybersecurity professionals, because so much of the credentialing is assessment-based already. Do you line up some of the curriculum against some of those credentials that people need to operate in the professional world? Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that you asked the question. Our cybersecurity degree program incorporates, um, boy, I should have the number memorized, 12 or 13 industry certifications into the curriculum. That is to say that, as I said, in a competency-based education system, the final exam for a course is really all that's required to pass the course. In some of those courses, our final exam is actually the industry certification exam. So, for example, the CompTIA Security Plus exam is the final exam for one of our courses here. We help students learn. We help students prepare. But then when, it's, when they're ready for that test, they sign up 
and take the CompTIA Security Plus exam. We have some, we ha and that really does, it does, I guess, three things. One is it helps validate the quality and the relevance of the education that we're providing here at WGU. Secondly, it helps students pursue jobs even before they have their degree. Because now, for I used Security Plus, for example, all kinds of Department of Defense contractors who want to have employees work on government contracts, for example, have to demonstrate a certain level of ability, usually as measured through these industry certifications. And Security Plus tends to be kind of that baseline certification that allows a contractor, say, to hire somebody and say, well, this person's eligible to work on this contract as a base level employee, for example. So someone, even before they've obtained their degree, is able to start getting either a better job or a promotion within their current job just because they have these sort of industry validated, industry sought certifications that they're earning as part of their curriculum. And uh, I know I said there were three things, and now I think I've talked myself out of the third one. Except, <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I would say, and it's along the lines of the second one, that our graduates, when they graduate, not only do they have now a, a college uh, diploma from whatever program they had, but they have a nice stack of industry certifications that help them. The thing that is that is essential, seemingly increasingly essential for people looking for jobs in security or really in most of the tech jobs is even a lot of the entry level jobs, these companies are looking for experience. Hey, we know this is an entry level job, but we'd love you to see we'd love to see three to five years of experience or the ability to do these things as you know, as we've probably all either given the interview or been the subject of an interview. That's great that you have all these certifications. That's what got you here to my office for this interview. Now, here's this dry erase marker. Go stand in front of the whiteboard and help me understand how you would build this system to be secure or what you would do in the case of this incident that just happened. And that's where the sort of hands-on practical experience becomes important. Not only are the industry exams and our own exams increasingly requiring sort of a not just multiple choice aspect, but actually doing something during the exam. The same is what we're requiring internally is much more of what we call a performance assessment. It's not just multiple choice, but you actually have to program something or design something or or articulate how you're going to respond to something, which is, again, helping our students so that when they graduate, they have not just the knowledge, but the demonstrated skill set so that they can go in and be effective in the workplace. Yeah, I've hired a lot of software developers over my career, and it's very hard for me to do the whiteboard thing anymore because it, they're just the tests are, are not really indicative of what's going to happen necessarily day to day. I, I can be like, you worked at this place and the references, you know, are, are important. And what I'm looking for, the way I've described it to folks is, it's one thing to be knowledgeable about project management, cybersecurity, software development. It's another thing to know the art of the thing. Yeah. That comes with experience, right? Whether it's working as an analyst in that early in stage, you know, yeah. early career role, and just being immersed in the environment of people thinking about security, that's it's just going to allow you to grow quicker than you imagine. You think you're spending time, but you're soaking up knowledge all along the way. Yeah, I also think uh, we talk a lot, and rightfully so, about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, in any workplace. And in cybersecurity, specifically, you think of Sadly, historically, a lot of sort of pasty, fat white guys with a pyramid of empty rock star cans on their desk or a whole bunch of Star Wars figurines stacked around their desk. And I love all of you that are like that because I'm pretty close to the description of those things. But increasingly, the diversity that we really need in this also uh, also introduces that that uniqueness of perspective to attack problems or to look at things differently. And so that's the, you asked early on, what's your advice for people looking into this? And that that's one of the things is, especially if you're a hiring manager, boy, keep your mind really open about the benefit of introducing diversity of thought into your team, whether that's through, you know, gender, whether that's through variations in educational preparation, because as you know, the bad people are getting more and more creative with their attacks and with uh, the ways that they're trying to compromise our systems. 
And so we need to be more and more creative. And that creativity really just comes from diversity of thought. Yeah, I agree completely. One of the things I recommend for teams that are looking for that diversity of thought is it also a willingness to bake in training as that, that new staff member comes on board. And that's helped us a lot. And we found a lot of diversity in thought in looking for veterans from the US military. And it's been great to bring in some young people with that experience growing into penetration testing or into security audits. It's worked really well. And especially for those service members who are coming, who are transitioning out of the out of the military. Boy, talk about hands on experience for so many of them and really high stakes systems that they're protecting or interesting and innovative sort of penetration activities that they may, may have been lucky enough to be part of. They bring with them a wealth of experience that a lot of people in the commercial marketplace have only read about in books or seen in movies sometimes. Well, Paul, one of the things that we like to do on Secure Talk is review a breach within the last 12 months or so. We like to pick one that may be in your alley a little bit. And really, this is a dialogue around what you think. And what I'll do is I'm going to review the breach information for us a little bit and uh, the organizational response to the breach. And then we can talk about risk perception, the threat landscape a little bit and response. Okay. So here we go. Today, we're going to be talking about a Microsoft breach. So beginning in May 15th of 2023, a China-based threat actor named Storm0558 used forged authentication tokens to access user email uh, for approximately 25 organizations, including government agencies and related consumer accounts to the government agencies in their Azure public cloud system. Now, it seems in the breach that uh, Storm0558 had uh, primarily targeted US and European diplomatic, economic, and legislative governing bodies and individuals that were connected to Taiwan and Uyghur geopolitical interests. Microsoft said that the hackers acquired one of its consumer signing keys or an MSA key, which the company used to secure consumer and email accounts. Originally, Microsoft thought that the hackers were forging authentication tokens using an acquired enterprise signing key, which are used to secure corporate enterprise email accounts. But what Microsoft found out was that the hackers used a consumer grade key to forge these tokens, which then allowed them to break into enterprise inboxes. And Microsoft said that there was a validation error in Microsoft code around key authentication. And the data that was breached were email communications for these government and organizational workers. So that's a little bit about the breach that Microsoft suffered. This happened between May and now we'll talk about the response really quickly. Identification of the campaign happened on June 16th of 2023. The investigation identified the inactive MSA consumer signing key uh, that was used to forge the tokens. And Microsoft quickly eliminated that key as being a valid key. Now the hackers did make a mistake uh, by using the same key to raid several inboxes, Microsoft uh, was allowed to uh, see all the access requests that had followed the pattern. So they were able to know exactly what data was compromised and notify those who were affected. And of course, uh, Microsoft identified the root cause, established a durable tracking of the, the hack and disrupted malicious activities. They've since hardened their environment, notified impacted customers, and coordinated with multiple entities. So this definitely lines up with that third party actor. We have a critical private enterprise that's storing information for government entities. It really hybridizes, I think, a lot of your experience. And the first thing that popped into my mind was key hijacking can be such a serious data breach. And I was really kind of surprised that we weren't testing consumer grade keys versus enterprise keys or that keys were invalidated appropriately. Yeah, I uh, in addition to the the technique, it, it's a level of sophistication, too, that we don't see in a lot of network attacks that smacks of. I mean, this one this one rep references this Chinese based group Storm 0558. And it reminds me of 
which I was frankly disappointed that it doesn't have a panda name associated with it because most of the APTs out of China have something with panda like the Russian groups that are something with bear in the name. But it, it definitely reminds me of the sophistication. I would say, if I segue for a second, that I used to sort of say that, you know, most of your typical network intrusions or attacks incidents are these sort of like smash and grab things. And thinking of like, if somebody broke into your house and you have a, say, a sliding glass door in the back of your house, the smash and grab would be you come home and the first thing you notice is there's a broken sliding glass door, there's glass on the floor, there are muddy footprints that come in through the broken door, lead all the way to your room where your secret jewelry box is hidden and the jewelry box is forced open and there's a couple of earrings along the track of the muddy footprints heading back out the back door. That's your ransomware attacks, that's some of your brute force attacks and whatnot. And these APT-like, or uh, more sophisticated attacks are more like the occasion where you come home and you actually don't see anything different in your house, but your security camera captured somebody breaking, not breaking, but compromising the lock on the sliding door, easing it open, and somebody creeping through your house with you know little booties on their muddy feet and not leaving a trail at all, opening the jewelry box and, and only selecting a couple of items and then walking out, shutting the door behind themselves and locking it again. And it, it makes me, some people say, well, gee whiz, don't I need to be worried about that? And I would say, yes, if you are somebody who administers tokens and keys for Microsoft's online web access, Outlook web access, yes, you should be worrying and validating these things. That's your job, man. You have one thing to do and that's that. But there <laughs> yeah. are millions of people like me who just want our email to work. And so we subscribe to a reputable organization that we entrust with all of that. And so, you know, the first thing that jumps out at me with this is, this is not your run of the mill. Somebody had a weak password. Somebody didn't use multi-factor authentication. Somebody left an old account lying around out there with, you know, like, you know, whatever on a VPN, hashtag yeah. colonial pipeline or whatever. Right. But this <laughs> yes. is a level of sophistication that you say, goodness gracious, this is the domain of real professionals. I think I look at it from two optics. One is as a normal consumer, this is why I pay my annual fee to Microsoft or whoever, because I say, this kind of stuff is your job, not mine. I just want my stuff to work and to be reasonably secure. And this is why when my computer says, I have an update, do you want me to install it? Yes, please, because there's a reason somebody did this. And then the other optic is, yeah, from that professional, as you've said, it's it's really all of the things that we do as consumers of, you know, well, do you have a good password? Are you using multi-factor authentication and, and whatever else? But it's taken to that next level to say, am I validating things that need to be validated? Am I looking at even, you know, am I, when, a, when so many times as an FBI agent back in the, you know, sort of one-off breach situations, well, what's the first place you want to look? Well, who did you fire recently? Or what contractors did you have in your system that you may not have off-boarded properly? Did you actually go through and eliminate all of their accesses? That, I would say, is kind of the mid-layer, you know, and then an attack like this just is a whole another layer of, of sophistication where this is where, like, graduates from our programs are really earning their money because they're doing the stuff that not only keeps their companies data safe, but all of us who rely on their companies to keep ourselves safe too. Well, Paul, all of us on the consumer side here are super grateful that you're bringing these professionals out into the marketplace. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm really grateful for the time you spent today on Secure Talk. It's been amazing to talk to you and learn uh, from your experiences. And so uh, we really appreciate you joining the podcast today. Hey, thanks, Justin. I have one more question for you before we leave. Please, yeah. What's your net Netflix password? <laughs> I can promise you it is different than every other password I have. <laughs> uh, it has special characters and capitals and numbers, and <laughs> I don't even know the length. There's like a differentiation in length, and I use an encrypted password management system to store them all. <laughs> so, Congratulations, you passed. Oh, thanks, Paul. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, 
<laughs> I'm going to come and uh, join a class there at WTU and get some credit hours. I think. <laughs> okay, sounds great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Take care.